Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. And um, it's just a beautiful day. Good to see Gary and Linda safely home. I hope you enjoyed your trip away. That's great. And Nancy and Delia, good to see you here. Thanks. Today we're looking at the household of the tenants and the son. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we open your word, I'd just like to pray for your Holy Spirit to be here, that all evil will be cast out of this place, that our hearts will be warmed by your message. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus had just entered the city of Jerusalem on a donkey for the last time amid much jubilation from the people. After this, Jesus went to the temple where his authority was again challenged. In Matthew twenty-one twenty-three, and when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, by what authority dost thou these things? And who gave ye this authority? This occurred on the Monday before the crucifixion on the Friday. Jesus made a bold statement by declaring the temple to be his house. In Matthew 21, 12 to 13, and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves, and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. So he's calling it his house. Um, interesting, because when he started his ministry, he did exactly the same thing. And um, the Pharisees and scribes said he won't be doing that again. And yet, when he did this, they fled. The renowned theologian Joachim Jeremias correctly grasped the meaning of the symbols of this parable in uh, Matthew 21. And, um, the householder represents God, the husbandman, leaders of Israel, act of leasing, God's call to Israel from Mount Sinai, the vineyard, Israel, the tower, the temple, the hedge, the Ten Commandments, the servants, the prophets, the son, Jesus, the fruits, the fruit of the Spirit, and the other husbandmen, the disciples, and the Gentiles. There are six historical stages to this parable which apply to both literal and spiritual Israel. So today we need to really have a look at these parables. Just about every parable tells us about the um, kingdom of heaven is like and um, Christ is always describing um, what's happening in heaven and, um, and what we're doing on earth. So it not only represents Israel, but it represents everyone even today, down to the last day. In Matthew, uh, sorry, I should have gone back to that. In Matthew 21, 34, And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. Prophets were sent to Israel during the 490 years of their probation and are also for the probation of the world at the end of time. The prophets of all time have been sent um, to just steer us, guide us, lead us and direct us in the true path that we should be following. Secondly, a further warning is sent in Matthew 21, 36. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. So Israel, the Old Testament, they were sent prophets and warning, and yet they rejected them. And again, he sent all the prophets during the 490 years, new prophets to warn Israel to walk and that their time of probation was due at the end of 490 years. 
Fortunately, we see judgment was passed down on the false teachers who tried to take control when they themselves asked what should be done to these wicked husbandmen. In Matthew 21, 41, they say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men. The fifth stage is when the husbandmen are removed and others are appointed to represent, uh, appointed represented by all those who preach the truth. The reformers were later a part of this group, right down to the 144,000. In Matthew 20, 21, 41, and they will let out his vineyard unto the other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. In Daniel, um, what does the parable say would happen in the sixth and final stage for those who reject the stone? Matthew 21, 44, I've gone too far. And whosoever shall fall on the stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Notice what Daniel says, what happens when the world is judged. Daniel 2, Daniel 2, 44. And in the days of these kings, past and present, shall the God of heaven be uh, set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. After their election at Mount Sinai, God sent Israel a plethora of prophetic messengers, but Israel mistreated them, so God allowed Israel to be taken captive to Babylon in 2 Corinthians 35, 15 to 8 and 16. We are also in the time of spiritual Babylon. Following the Babylonian captivity, God sent them and us, more messengers, and Israel did likewise with them. Matthew 23, 37. God sent and is again to send his own son, Jesus, and they crucified him. And what do we do to him? I think of what we're doing to him in our hearts. The kingdom was removed from literal Israel and given to the Gentiles, Matthew 21, 43, and Acts 13, 46, 47. But this is not the end of the story. For anyone who knowingly rejects the, the oracles Jesus has given to the church, the stone which the builders rejected will crush those who reject him. With literal Israel, when Jesus took Israel out of Egypt and a remnant out of sin, he... Uh, for us today, he did and is doing everything possible to bless them. In Deuteronomy 7, 6, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon, upon the face of the earth. And in Deuteronomy 14, 2, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. Today we look at peculiar as being strange, but these are peculiar in that they're very different to any other people. They are noticed and observed. When Jesus told the parable of the vineyard earlier in the scripture, he speaks to both spiritual Israel and the nation of Israel. In Isaiah 5, 1 to 7, we read, Now will I sing unto my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. This is much like what Solomon wrote in the Song of Songs. And he fenced it, and he gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. In verse 3, Now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. 
Verse 4, What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes? And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned, nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant, and he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. Verse 7 is very sad. Jesus is looking for a people who could exercise judgment, but found oppression where righteousness should have been and could only hear the cry of the oppressed. And so it's very sad that that happened um, to Israel and very much is happening to us today. In Ezekiel chapter 22, 29 to 31, the people of the land have oppressed and exercised robbery, have used oppression and exercised robbery, and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap bef uh, before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. God chose Israel as a nation with the purpose of preserving his law and the truth, and that they were to prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah. This they failed to do. The Seventh-day Adventist Church members have also been taken out of the bondage of sin and are also to preserve God's law and the truth, to listen to the prophet and prepare the world for Christ's second coming. <clears throat> What was God's glorious plan for the children of Israel, both literal and spiritual? Deuteronomy 4, verse 5 to 8. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. In verse 7, For what nation is there, is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day. God's people are to stand out and be known by all the nations of the world. And this is why the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the Catholic Church are the only two that are nationwide, worldwide um, churches. And they both do very similar things. They both have health messages and, um, and church um, and um, hospitals everywhere, and to have a huge influence. One is right, one is wrong. And if you watch what they teach, there's some little books on the, uh, at the table as you go out in the doorway. It compares um, what the, the papal system says about scripture and what the truth in the Bible is. So take one and read it, and if you want to share it with anyone, um, you can take some more. God's people are to stand out and to be known by all the nations of the world. First Chronicles sixteen twenty-three to twenty-five. We read, "Sing unto the Lord, all the earth; show forth from day to day His salvation; declare His glory among the heathen, His marvelous works among all nations." 
For great is the Lord, and great to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. God now describes his plan for Israel in the book of Deuteronomy and John, which is conditional for all believers. In Deuteronomy 6, uh, 7, verse 6, verse 9, and verse 12 to 15, we read, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto him above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Verse 12, Wherefore it shall come to pass, if ye hearken unto the judgments, and hearken to these judgments, and keep them, and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he swears, he swear unto thy fathers, and he will love thee, and bless thee, and multiply thee, he will also bless the fruit of thy womb, and the fruit of thy land, thy corn and thy wine, and thine oil, the increase of thine kind, and the flocks of thy sheep, in the land which he swear unto the, thy fathers to give thee. Thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you, or among your cattle, and the Lord will take away from thee all sickness, and will put none of these evil diseases on Egypt, which thou knowest upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. So we've got to ask you the question, do we really love Jesus? In John 14, 15, 1 to 7, uh, 1 and uh, 15, uh, to 17, sorry. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. So conditional, if you keep my commandments, uh, love me and keep my commandments. I will pray to the Father and he will give you the comforter. That's the Holy Spirit, the latter rain. This is God's plan for Israel of the Old Testament and for us today. So how are we doing? In John seven eighteen, He that speaketh of himself seeks his own glory, but he that seeks his glory has, that sent him. The same is true and no unrighteousness is in him. So do we seek our own glory? Don't, do we always say, aren't I good? I can preach a good sermon, I can do this, I can do that. Everything should be done to God's glory. It's nothing to do with us. And he's given us his word so that he may be uplifted in our hearts. So this is God's plan for Israel, for the Old Testament and for us today. How are we doing? In John 7, 18, oh, sorry, yeah. 7, 18, he that speaketh of himself seeks his own glory. So God's awesome plan for the salvation of the world is described in this way. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 290, paragraph 1, but it was God's purpose that by the revelation of his character through Israel, men should be drawn unto him to all the world, the gospel invitation was to be given. Through the teaching of the sacrificial service, Christ was to be uplifted before his creatures. So that's his plan, is for us to take this gospel to all the world, that God may be uplifted in everything that we do. The rabbis, in trying to reach perfection for themselves, made rules that opposed the Ten Commandments, uplifting themselves. In Matthew 15, 7 to 9, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines, commandments of men. 
Jesus tried all he could to bring Israel back to his original plan. In Luke 13, verse 34 to 35, we read, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets, and stones them that are sent unto them, thee, how often would I have gathered thee, thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings. And ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, and verily I say unto you, you shall not see me until the time come, when you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. It's interesting because the first temple that uh, Solomon built, um, God's presence was in there. I mean, it was shown when um, fire came down from heaven and burnt up the offering on the altar, and his pre presence was always there. It could be seen in the wilderness um, tabernacle as well, smoke by day and fire, uh, fire by night. And, um, and it's... The people mourned when they rebuilt that temple at the end of the Babylonian captivity and they were sad because it was nowhere near as good as the original. And there weren't many people to do it because only 5,000 people left Babylon. The rest of them felt too comfortable and stayed there. And, um, and they were just really worried. But um, God said that his presence, his this temple would be more glorious. And it was more glorious in the fact that Jesus Christ would come and be in that temple. In Matthew 23, 29-31, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the fair prophets um, and garnish the sepulchres of, old, of the righteous, and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. So by saying that they were the father, they, their fathers were killing the prophets, they were admitting that, that their um, parenthood were walking astray. As we... Listen to God. Are we listening to God's prophets? According to 2 Chronicles 36 17 to 20, the wrath of God was poured out against Israel, and as a consequence, they were taken captive to Babylon for 70 years. They were then given 490 year time of probation. Since the 2300 year prophecy in 1844, we are spiritual Babylon, Babylon and we need to listen also to the prophets. After Babylonian captivity, God sent prophets to direct Israel's paths to safety, and yet they totally ignored the prophets. In Ezra 5.2, and with them were the prophets of God helping them. Israel started out well under consecrated leaders or faithful husbandmen. And the book of Malachi reveals that the prophets' successors, the Pharisees and Sadducees, unfaithful husbandmen led the people into apostasy once more and the same is happening today what did god do as the last resort to try and reach the jewish nation matthew 21 37 but last of all he sent unto them his son saying they will reverence my son the gospel of mark says that the householder sent a beloved son which is a very title applied to Jesus in Mark uh, chapter 1, verse 9 to 11. The expression, last of all, indicates finality. So this was a final judgment on Israel as a nation. The Son will make the last call for the Jewish nation to produce fruit. If they don't, they will be cut down and cast into the fire. Jesus was treated like the prophets, who also tried all they could to bring Israel back to a covenant relationship with God. As we study God's word and what the prophets have warned us of, I pray that we do not kill the son by pushing him out of our lives and out of our hearts. Matthew 21, 38 to 39. 
We read, But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir, come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Very much like what um, um, Jezebel did to the, the farmer whose farm Ahab desired. Joachim Jeremiah described the custom of the day. He said, The arrival of the sun allows them to assume that the owner is dead and that the sun has come to take up his inheritance. If they kill him, the vineyard becomes ownerless property, which they can claim as being first on the spot. And that's from Joachim uh, Jeremiah's Parables of Jesus, pages 75 to 76. In South Africa, the farmers were going through very much this problem where farm laborers would move into the farm. If you weren't there to push them out, if you were on holiday or something, they could claim that land as being theirs because it had been abandoned. And so you couldn't leave it for more than a week without the claim coming in. In the light of Luke chapter 20, verse 9, Jeremiah's remarks, are accurate. There we are told that the householder went into a far country for a long time. This seems to indicate that the vine dressers believed the owner was an absentee landlord. In their minds, it was only the son who stood between them and the inheritance. Ironically, if the Jews had accepted Jesus, they would have become joint heirs with him of the Father's promises in Romans 8:17. But by rejecting him, they forfeited any right to the inheritance. The promises were made to Abraham and his seed in Galatians 3.16. And only those who choose to unite with the seed, which is Christ, capital S, inherit the promises in Galatians 3.29. Jesus was killed after being cast out of Jerusalem, John 19.17, Hebrews 13.12-13. In this sense, he was cast out of the vineyard and killed. The Jewish leaders knowingly denied Jesus as being God. Today, Jesus is in a far country, and if we do not spend time studying and praying long hours together, as did the disciples at Pentecost, we will not receive the latter rain. During the week, on Tuesday afternoons between 3.15 and I think 5 o'clock, um, Ian is having a study at his house, um, and I just appeal to everyone, if you'd like to go to that study or come to the church on Wednesdays from 3.30 till 5 o'clock um, and study together. It's a time for deep study, for deep prayer, um, prayer for one another, and especially prayer for the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to direct and guide us so we will be ready and we will be able to take that final message to the world, and especially this community. And the reason why we struggle so much in this community is, um, I guess, because we don't have that latter rain yet. With the power of the latter rain, we change hearts. You look at the disciples, um, <clears throat> what happened there when they received the message at Pentecost, um, they were of one accord, they were praying together, studying together, and understanding the gospel together. And then the, latter rain, the early rain was poured out. They were baptizing 300 a day. This is Jews, people who had walked away from God, people who were believing in the wrong belief. And so I believe that the other churches in um, this area will be drawn if we stand out and we're shown to be different, we're shown to be a peculiar people. In John 19.15, it says, But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to him, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief of priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So who is our, your God, my God, your idol, my idol, your king and my king? They believed that if they could kill the son, 
then there would no longer be any issue. Their consciences wouldn't be pricked anymore, and uh, they'd be able to carry on with life, happy as it was for them. In Matthew 7, 20, uh, 27, 25, Then all the people answered and said, Let his blood be on us and on our children. That was tragic. Absolutely tragic, because that is very much what happened in 70 AD. The Pharisees and scribes answered Jesus' following quest, question that he was speaking to them in Matthew 21, 40 to 41. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? And they say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. <clears throat> so notice what Jesus said in the parable when they spoke of their own doom. And also, again, it applies very much to us. You know, don't let us say, you know, it's up to our kids. Um, and that they should be following what we're saying. They need to study this for themselves. Luke uh, 20, verse 16, He shall come and destroy these husbandmen, and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. And, you know, this, this is, needs to be our prayers. God forbid that any of our children are lost, and um, any of us are just destroyed. Are we knowingly snubbing Jesus by believing on righteousness is enough? When Jesus left the temple which he had called his father's house, he was now no more to have his glory in it, and he called the temple their house. Is this our church or the Lord's church? Is my heart mine or is it God's house? In Matthew 23, 38 to 39, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. In verse 39, For I say unto you, You shall not see me henceforth, till you say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 and 19, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of the harlot? God forbid. What, know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? As our bodies, are our bodies the temple? Is Christ uh, welcomed to reside in us? If we follow the doctrines of our own desires, our temple body will also be left desolate. This parable does not apply alone to the Jewish nation. In Christ's Object Lessons, page uh, 296, paragraph 2, the parable of the vineyard applies not only, not alone to the Jewish nation, it has a lesson for us. The church is, in this generation has been endowed by God with great privileges and blessings, and he expects corresponding returns. And again, Page 298, paragraph 2. Christ hungers to receive from his vineyard the fruit of holiness and unselfishness. He looks for the principles of love and goodness. Not all the beauty of art can bear comparison to the beauty of temper and character to be revealed in those who are Christ's representatives. So if Christ is in our hearts, we should have that perfect character. And in page 300, paragraph 3, God imparts his gifts to us that we also may give and thus make known his character to the world. The Seventh-day Adventist Church today is in danger of following the same path as ancient Israel. Revelation 3.17, Christ says, Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and this is Jesus speaking to Laodicean church, the last of the seven. And this is our time, our day, in the church in today's age. Jesus gives a, a dire warning to the church today. If it fails to repent, am I or are we like Israel of old? 
It says in verse 16, Christ says, So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Very, very strong words. Like with the Pharisees and Sadducees, when Jesus spews lukewarm, the lukewarm out of his mouth, it will cause the shaking of the church. He will no longer hear the prayers of the lukewarm. Jesus is standing outside the door, knocking and hungering for the fruit of holiness. In Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. What a day that will be. And so we need to ask him to do that for us right now. God has given the Seventh-day Adventist Church great prophetic light in the areas of education, medical work, publishing, family life, lifestyle, health, etc. Do we as believers in him really obey the great light we have been given? The whole earth is now God's vineyard. We are the husbandmen, a worldwide movement, and we are here to protect, nurture, and work in the vineyard till it brings forth a great harvest which belongs to God. Am I, are we, working in the vineyard for our own benefit and the salvation, or are we glorifying God by individually spending time with him in prayer and study every day and corporately learning of his ways to bring forth a great harvest of every trunk, uh, tongue, tribe, nation, and people before Jesus returns. In Second Peter 2, verse 2 to 3, oh, that's Matthew. You go back one. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness shall they, with feigned words, make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. God is desperately warning his people not to slumber, as did Peter, James, and John, when Jesus was in great anguish and went to pray, asking them to watch. And the world is rushing to his ruin, and still Jesus is drinking of that cup of wrath of his Father on our behalf. He's taking the cup that we deserve, and he's taking it unto himself, so we may not have to drink that cup of wrath. Matthew twenty-eight nineteen, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. By Subject Lessons, page 303, paragraph 1, Men are in peril, multitudes are perishing, but how few of the process of the professed followers of Christ are burdened for these souls. There is a stupor, a paralysis upon the people of God, which prevents them from understanding the duty of the, the hour. We may be in a difficult area where many others have been warned not to attend any meetings we may hold, so we need the latter rain power to give us the advantage in attracting others to God. For too long we have tried evangelism under our own strength. And again in Christ's object lesson, page 303, paragraph 2, with the whole world before them in need of the gospel, professed Christians congregate where they themselves can enjoy the gospel privileges. They do not feel the necessity of occupying new territory, carrying the message of salvation into regions beyond. Are they less guilty than was the Jewish church? As with the Israelites, God is working to redeem us, to become his sons and daughters, until Jesus comes again for his children, his brothers and sisters, before the fullness of time. Our great hope is found in Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope 
and the glorious appearing of the great God in, and our Saviour Jesus Christ. In verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Let's get together and sacrifice time to pray earnestly for the power of the Holy Spirit. Study together and allow the Spirit to unite us in love for the lost. There is no other name like Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you do have tough messages for us from time to time and that you do also have messages that would lift our hearts. But today I just pray that we can draw closer to you and desire your Holy Spirit, the latter rain power, to help us through the last days. Let us not be like the uh, five foolish virgins who did not have the latter rain, the Holy Spirit. They knew the truth, but they didn't act upon it. And uh, we just pray that we are wise virgins. We will, as a latter rain, to take that gospel to the world and that we will follow Jesus in to his home. And so, Father, be with each one of us and help us in these days because times are going to be very, very hard. Difficult times are ahead. And, Lord, may we not be hoping to be under the grass rather than above the grass. So, Lord, be with us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.